on the crest of Hill 145, Walter Allward's memorial that came to him in a dream stands forever as testimony to Canada's sacrifice in the Great War. What can we find here as we explore Vimy Ridge in a day? It's another of our Battlefields in a Day podcasts where we focus on a particular battlefield of the Great War and we look at what we can see and understand in the course of a day's visits. And what we do is break that battlefield up into two parts, usually a morning visit and an afternoon visit, and we'll do that in this episode. And I did one recently about the battlefields of Arras in northern France, and that's where we are again this week in northern France, and we're close to the city of Arras. And when I did that podcast at looking at the battlefields around Arras in a day, I mentioned that in that one we wouldn't feature Vimy Ridge because that was worthy of its own podcast. And that's where we are today, looking at Vimy in a day. Now, for many people, many Canadians, but not just Canadians, because I would guess that most British visitors to the Western Front will go or will have been to Vimy at some point. For most people, a visit to Vimy Ridge is straight into the Canadian Memorial Park, to the visitor centre area, to the preserved trenches, and up onto the highest point of the ridge at Hill 145, to see that magnificent Canadian memorial, probably one of the most beautiful, if not the most impressive memorials on the British part of the Western Front. But Vimy is a wider battlefield, and that's what we're hoping to look at during the course of this podcast. And breaking it into two, what we'll do in the morning is go from behind the lines up to the front line area, And if you've listened to this podcast before, you'll know I like that approach in visiting battlefields. It's important to see the perspective of the ground today in a similar perspective to the troops who were there more than 100 years ago. They didn't just go straight into the trenches. They moved from the area behind the line up to that battlefield area to go into the battle, to take part in the attack, to serve in the trenches. And we'll do that in the first part of this podcast and go up onto the ridge And we'll see those classic sites like the Canadian Memorial and the the trenches in the visitors area. But in the afternoon, what we'll do is go from north to south along Vimy Ridge and look at some of the other areas outside of the Canadian Memorial Park and some of the cemeteries, particularly the battlefield cemeteries, and indeed many of the forgotten memorials, because there isn't just one Vimy memorial. Several were put up at different points, some of them during the war itself, commemorating the Canadian participation in that battle in April 1917. And we'll see some of those. And I hope it'll give you a a wider understanding of what there is on the Vimy Ridge battlefield today, and also an understanding of the Canadian participation and role in this crucial attack, crucial operation of 1917. As always with the Battlefields in the Day podcasts, there are limitations. We can't see everything. There are, for example, a lot more cemeteries behind the lines where the wounded from the fighting at Vimy were brought back to, and there were British units on the flanks of the Canadians to the north around Boison Ash near to Givinchy, and to the south on the British sector of the Arras front. And we've covered some of that in, in other podcasts, and no doubt we'll cover other bits of it in future podcasts as well but we're focusing solely in this on the Canadian core aspect of the Vimy Ridge operation. Now this is not the first time we've looked at Vimy Ridge in the old frontline podcast and if you go back into the podcast archive you'll find some other episodes and I'll put links on the podcast page for this to the podcast pages for those episodes as well and there's some others looking at particular battlefield cemeteries or the Vimy Memorial and the meaning of Vimy as well and we spoke to Sam Cowan in the podcast some time ago about the impact that Vimy has on the Canadian mindset and we'll touch on that I'm sure in this podcast as well because Vimy has this great symbolism for Canada whether we like it or we loathe it or we're indifferent to it it does for most Canadians for most Canadians coming to Vimy Ridge this is their great war, this is Canada's great war, this is the point in which all those paths of Canada's great war cross. And I think it's important to recognise that and 
to celebrate it in in a degree as well because it's what draws Canadians and, and indeed many others into the story of the Great War and there's a way of then telling the wider role and the wider participation of Canadian troops explaining that to a Canadian audience through their interest in coming to see Vimy because as we'll discover even the Vimy Memorial does not just commemorate Vimy Ridge in 1917. Now in terms of books and guidebooks and as usual we'll put some indications of those onto the podcast website. Not surprisingly there are quite a few books on Vimy Ridge. Some going back to the 50th anniversary period of the Great War when a couple of seminal works were written by British authors. Some of those done when the access to veterans of course was was much greater. Pierre Bertin, Canadian writer, I remember going to Vimy in 1987, incredibly on the 70th anniversary of Vimy Ridge and when I think that this weekend I'm about to head to Normandy for the 78th anniversary of Normandy, I realise how long I've been visiting some of these battlefields. But anyway, in 87 I met some Canadians, one of whom, Ed Storey, became a lifelong friend and he was there with his dad uh, and they had a copy of Bertrand's Vimy book which I'd never come across in those pre-internet days. Amazingly there were those days. It was difficult to know about some of these books so that was an interesting account of Vimy. And then coming right up to date there's been a lot of work by other authors like Tim Cook and also uh, Norm Christie for example who's written quite a few guidebooks on the Canadians in the Great War, a specific title connected to the battlefields at Vimy Ridge from a Canadian perspective. And Norm's done a lot of TV work as well, and you'll find his documentaries on places like Amazon Prime and also on YouTube. So there's some good subsidiary material that you can use to get an understanding of Vimy, whether that's before you go or whether it's during your visit or afterwards, all of those tie together the strands of what a battlefield visit is all about. And in terms of some historical background to the fighting at Vimy in 1917, we have done previous podcasts on Vimy, and you can go back for some more depth there, but to give a kind of broad outline so we know where we are for this particular day's visit, if we look at the Canadians in the Great War, Canada was a Dominion nation in 1914, And what that meant was it was self-governing. It had its own Canadian militia, which was roughly the equivalent of the British Territorial Force, the Territorial Army. It had the Royal Canadian Regiment, the main regular regiment of the Canadian Army. But that was small in number in terms of its military force. When the Great War began and Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914, Dominion nations that were part of the wider British Empire volunteered their troops to serve as well and Canada entered the war and a Canadian expeditionary force was formed by creating numbered battalions of infantry by raising the support units like the Canadian Field Artillery, the Canadian Army Medical Corps, the Canadian Service Corps and all these other units to form Canadian divisions and the first Canadian division came together in Canada then went to Britain to train on Salisbury Plain in 1914 and when we look at that original Canadian Expeditionary Force and in particular the units within that first Canadian division the original Canadians who came across at the beginning of the Great War something like 70 percent of them were born in Great Britain and this gives you an idea of what Canada was like in 1914 it was this vast nation in terms of its geography its population was relatively small and a lot of it was immigrant population that had come in from all over the world but in particular from Great Britain. So it's not surprising that was reflected in the enlistments. But when you look at Canada generally in the Great War, particularly in that early period when there was voluntary enlistment, conscription came later in the war, just like Britain. But if you look at those voluntary enlistments at the early phase of the war, it shows what a truly international army the Canadian Expeditionary Force was, because men were literally coming from all over the world to come and live in Canada. They felt a connection to Canada, and when the war came along, they wanted to serve and step forward and do their bit for Canada as well. And that is really reflected in the men who fought in the battles of the Great War under the flag of Canada and under the uniform of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Their first battle of the Great War, having gone across to the Western Front in early 1915, was the Second Battle of Ypres which was a defensive battle where the Germans, using poison gas for the first time, pushed the Canadians back. They defended Ypres, 
and were one of the principal units in stopping the Germans from breaking through on that northeastern part of the battlefield. The Canadians remained in Flanders. Some Canadian units took part in the fighting in northern France around Givinci and Festubert in 1915. And then in 1916, the Battle of the Central Loire Craters in the spring saw increased Canadian units serving on the Western Front and taking part in actions. It was an attack, the Battle of the Central Loire Craters, but not an offensive really. And it was part of the learning curve of the Canadians in the Great War to understand what trench warfare was, was all about. 1916 saw the year of the Battle of the Somme and for Canada they entered the fray on the 15th of September when Canadian troops from the now Canadian Corps with four Canadian divisions brought together under one command, not a Canadian general at this point, a British general, Julian Bing. Arthur Curry, then a divisional commander, would go on to take command of the Canadian Corps in time for the Battle of Passchendaele in late 1917, for example, and serve as their commander until the end of the war. But the Canadian Corps made its first proper attack of the Great War at Corselet on the 15th September, capturing the village of Corselet, a symbolic moment when, for the first time in the 20th century, Canadian soldiers liberated a part of Europe, in this case France, and that would have a resonance throughout much of the rest of the next half century in terms of what Canada did in the Second World War, for example, from Juneau Beach from D-Day to the end of the war in the Netherlands. The Somme, the fighting around Corselet and Regina Trench, cost the Canadians 24,000 casualties in 1916, and after those operations, the units of the Canadian Corps gradually moved up to the sector around Arras and took over from British units the positions on Vimy Ridge. Now, there was already in hand a plan to make an attack around Arras the following year, and Vimy would be part of it. It's not a separate battle. Many Canadians believe that it is, but it's part of the Greater Battle of Arras. And one thing you learn about battles and battlefields of the Great War is that high ground is all important. And near Arras, there were two pieces of high ground, Notre Dame de Lorette to the north. That was captured by the French in 1915. They then had an attempt on two occasions, both in May and September of that year, to try and take Vimy Ridge, but it proved a tough nut to crack. French colonial troops did get right up onto the crest of the ridge at some points, but the attacks around them failed and they were pushed back. So by 1916, when British troops initially took over from the French, this was a quiet sector, the lines were beneath the ridge and the Germans were on the dominant ground looking down towards the city of Arras. In 1917, as the Battle of Arras approached, the Canadians now holding this sector, many of them in these very tightly located outpost lines where the distance across from their front line to the German front line was only a mine crater, and you see that on the battlefield today very visibly in the Canadian Memorial Park. The Canadians had been forewarned that As part of that Battle of Arras, there would be an attack here, and that attack took place on the morning of the 9th of April 1917, when the Canadian Corps in this very northern part of the Arras attack made their assault on the ridge. Now, British and Commonwealth Empire units, as they were then, serving as part of the greater British Expeditionary Force, which the Canadian Corps was a part of, were on this learning curve. It's a phrase that some historians triumphed in the 90s, They've tried to move away from it, but I think it it probably adequately describes what the British Army was doing. We tend to think from things like Blackadder, which of course is comedy and not documentary, that the Great War was fought in the same way again and again and again. But when we look at the detail, we see that the approach to fighting and the way fighting took place changed dramatically over the course of those four years. And Canada had learnt a lot on the Somme in 1916, as had other units of the BEF. And one of the principal things that everyone had learned was the importance of artillery to plan your bombardment, to have increased levels of heavy artillery, to smash up the German defences, to not have an inflexible plan for the use of artillery, to be able to react on the ground when units require artillery to be brought back to support them in their attack if that attack was breaking down, and also to target key areas like bunkers, strong points, defensive positions more clearly and more carefully and and more cleverly really than just trying to saturate the ground with shell fire. In addition to that the introduction of new weapons, new fuses for shrapnel shells to cut the wire, the increased and developed use of creeping barrages to lay in front of attacking troops to protect them as they move forward across the landscape towards their objective, the role of tanks, the role of trench mortars with livens projectors firing gas shells at German positions and the increased importance of machine guns as well 
meant that all of that came together in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, with Julian Bing, the commander of the Canadian Corps, acting like the conductor of an orchestra, in this case a military orchestra, and you bringing all of this together to create victory. So when you look at the fighting at Vimy, soldiers fought soldiers. Men went over the top with bayonets fixed and got into the German lines and fought their way through them. But on top of that, on the different layers of the battle, you see nearly a million rounds being fired at the German positions along the ridge by the Canadian artillery and the supporting British artillery. My old friend Malcolm Vivian, his siege batteries were involved in supporting the Canadian Corps in 1917, and it shows what a coalition battle, what a coalition war the Great War was. There was a massive machine gun barrage as well, and the implementation of machine guns in the attack on Vimy Ridge is an important part of our understanding as to how victory was achieved. And also the idea of leapfrogging through positions where you don't just get one unit to capture everything. You utilise the men you have to take objectives in stages, move troops through other troops, and allow the battle to move on. And what you see over the course of five days at Vimy in April 1917 is the four Canadian divisions acting as an entire unified corps, moving forward, capturing the bulk of the ridge in the early phase, and the final phase to the north with the capture of the high ground around the Pimple. And by the 14th of April, so in five days of fighting, the whole of the ridge is captured. The Canadians have moved into the flat Douai plain beyond, looking towards the city of Lens and beyond that Douai itself. And it's not the Germans dominating the battlefield now. It's the Canadians and later the British troops who served here following the Canadian withdrawal and their move to other parts of the front. So Vimy, the capture of Vimy, changed the landscape, the military geography of the landscape here because it moved the German dominance of the ground away and brought in the Allied dominance of this ground which proved to be unstoppable when the Germans tried to break through here in 1918. For Canada and the Canadian Corps, Vimy was a success. Their objective was taken, but these objectives always came at a cost. The Canadians lost over 10,000 men in those five days of fighting at Vimy in April 1917. Three and a half thousand of them killed in action. So it wasn't a small price that Canada paid for that victory. And post-war, the symbolism of Vimy in the Canadian mind grew. Whether it was in the interwar period that Canadians began to talk about Canada coming together on the slopes of Vimy Ridge is debatable. There's been some interesting discussions about this on Bread St. Croix's on this day in Canadian Military History Channel on YouTube, and I'd recommend checking that out. And he joined me with some other Canadian historians for a discussion about this on a Twitter space some time ago. It seems to be more of a, a post-Second World War Canadian view, particularly in the approach to the 50th anniversary. But there's no doubt that that concept of Canada and its moment on Vimy Ridge, that point in which it took those greater steps in a wider world, it is an important one and it continues to be important for Canadians today. So that's some of our backgrounds. We're going to head out now for the first part of our journey and we'll begin behind the lines on the Vimy sector north of Arras. We begin our approach to Vimy Ridge behind the lines near to the village of villers au bois and we're starting at Villers Station Cemetery. This is a military cemetery created when the British took over this sector from the French in 1916. Originally, it had been a French burial ground for the dead from the battles around this sector in the early period of the war, from the battle of the craters, the mine craters that were close by, then up to the fighting around Notre Dame de Lorette, Suchet, and the attacks, the early attacks on Vimy Ridge. The French had had medical facilities here, and many of the French soldiers, no doubt, would have been men that had died of their wounds, just like some of those who were buried in this cemetery from British and Commonwealth units died of their wounds received on the front line. But certainly when we look at the Canadian records of some of the burials in here, we find men who had been killed up at the front line and brought back here for burial. So the British graves date from the early 1916 period up into that late summer of 1916, and then the Canadian Corps begins to move up from the Somme. They bury their dead here on into the battles around Vimy in 1917. Post-war, there were some concentrations to the cemetery, many of them from isolated communal cemeteries in the surrounding area, and the French graves were moved either 
back home to wherever those French soldiers came from to be buried with their family, or they were taken to Notre Dame de Lorette in the massive French military cemetery there and were reburied in one of the many plots there. The burials total 1,001 Canadian soldiers are buried here, 176 British, 20 South Africans and 32 Germans. The Germans being prisoners of war that were brought back wounded from the front line and died of their wounds in the casualty clearing stations that were in this area. When we look at the Canadian graves, it gives us a good cross-section of the different units of the Canadian Corps that were involved in that so-called quiet period of 1916-17 when the Canadians first moved up here. And what we see is, is quite a few casualties in that period, so it wasn't entirely without loss. When a unit held the line, men could be killed and wounded every single day in those day-to-day -day activities of trench warfare. And in a forerunner for the attack on Vimy Ridge, on the 1st of March 1917, there was an assault by some of the units in the 4th Canadian Division on Vimy Ridge using a large amount of gas. It wasn't a particularly successful attack and possibly is worthy of a podcast in its own right, but buried in here are two battalion commanders of the units principally involved who were killed during that assault on the 1st of March 1917. One of them is Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Beckett, commanding officer of the 75th Canadian Infantry Battalion. He was from Toronto, Canadian-born, so he was a Canadian-born battalion commander, which would have been probably relatively rare at that stage. The battles of 1915-16, most of the commanders were often ex-British regulars or had been born in Britain and emigrated to Canada. By the time of Vimy, that was beginning to change, and he was killed in that attack age 47. Very not far away is Lieutenant Colonel Arnold Henry Grant Kemble, DSO. He was the commanding officer of the 54th Canadian Infantry Battalion, otherwise known as the Kootenays. His family was from Kent in Britain originally. His wife lived in British Columbia. He joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force at the beginning of the war. He had previous service in the Indian Army. He'd served as a Gurkha officer before the war. And he took the Kootenays, the 54th Canadians, from Canada to Britain and across to the trenches of the Western Front, first in the line in Flanders around Ypres and then on the Somme in the fighting around, particularly around Regina Trench in October and November of 1916, and then they moved up to take part in the fighting around or holding the line around Arras. I have some early postcards of the 54th Battalion showing them in their training period, and Kimball stands there, quite a big man, very tall, very impressive, you can see that he is a leader of men and he was killed aged 56 taking his battalion into that attack on the 1st of March 1917. The main Vimy plots here are in plots 5 to 10 and you can see again a good cross section of the different units that took part in the assault and the kind of casualties they had that were being brought back for treatment in the casualty clearing stations and subsequently died of their wounds. The 52nd Canadian Infantry Battalion once had a wooden memorial cross in this cemetery to their dead from the Vimy action. It's no longer here now. I hope it's back in Canada, and if any listener has got some information as to where that is, it would be very interesting to know. These are often mentioned in cemetery registers that are a cross or a memorial to an individual unit stood in the cemetery. None of them survived, with one exception, and that was an original memorial that was replaced by a stone one at Kujil British Cemetery in the Arras sector. But uh, I often think that perhaps there should be a register of these somewhere and, and someone do some research on the fate of these memorials because I would guess probably quite a lot of them survive in churches, cathedrals and, and other buildings. I remember seeing crosses to individual units in Chelsea Barracks for some of the London battalions, for example. But coming back to the Canadians, one of the other reasons why we've started here is that we're very, very close to the Canadian Corps headquarters at Camblain Abbey. They had a, a chateau there that was used by Bing and his staff. Bing was a good and highly respected commander by the Canadian troops. He would go on to become Governor General of Canada later in his life. But like all commanders, Canadian, British or otherwise, they needed an area to actually make their unit, their corps, function and they needed a big building to do that, an area where they could disseminate all the information coming back from the front line, have staff to process it and understand it, and then have rooms to have meetings to decide what they would do. The route to victory at Vimy 1917 was not just on the battlefield itself, it began in the planning stage at Corps headquarters, and in the minds of the staff officers who really built that 
battle brick by brick from nothing from their shared experience of 1916, the Somme and indeed before. Leaving the cemetery will travel through the nearby village of villers aux bois Being away from the battlefield area, many of these villages contain original buildings from the period because they weren't damaged or destroyed in the same way that the village of Vimy, for example, right up on the battlefield was completely wiped off the map by the bombardments of 1917-18. Here, these weren't. So original barns, original buildings many of them used by the Canadians, survive. And some of them contain graffiti of Canadian and indeed British and French troops before them. So it's an interesting little time capsule, a lot of these villages that we travel through. From villers aux bois we'll make our way to Equavre, and we're coming through that rear area. So Canadian units serving up in the line around Vimy before the battle itself would have been coming back to villages like this for a degree of rest, for a bit of rest and recuperation, refit their equipment, maybe do a bit of training, sleep in barns, sleep in some of the buildings, and then go back up the line to begin their frontline service all over again. As the battle moved forward in its progress in the capture of the German positions, quite a large number of German prisoners were taken, and they were brought back to villages like villers aux bois and Equave, which we're coming into now. And there are photographs of German prisoners being escorted back through villages like this, taken by some of the Canadian official photographers. In Equavre, we come to the Equavre Military Cemetery. Again, it's a cemetery started by the French in 1914-15. With the case of Villa Station Cemetery, those French graves were removed here at Equavre. Some of them still remain here, and you can see the French presence. But it's only a fraction of their original burials, and many of those would have been taken again to places like Notre Dame de Lorette. The 51st Highland Division, who would continue to serve in this area for quite some time on and off, started the British burials in this cemetery in March of 1916, and then other British units holding the Vimy sector buried their dead here as well. Again, the Canadian Corps, when they moved up after the Somme, they began a plot here, and we see that reflected in the way the burials are made. In many respects, the cemetery is in kind of date order, so you can follow the progress of units and the progress of fighting as you walk through it. One of those who passed through Equavre in 1916, before the Canadians arrived, was Ralph Vaughan Williams. He was serving in the Royal Army Medical Corps as part of the 60th London Division. They held this sector during the time of the Battle of the Somme, when this was a quiet part of the line. Vaughan Williams would go on to become one of the most important composers of the British composers of the 20th century, and some of his music really dates from this time at Equavre. Lark ascending, whenever I come here I think of him and his time in the dressing station here. Was it inspired by those days he spent in Equavre with the skylarks high above him on this big open landscape where nature and the modern world came together in the terrible strands of what the war had become by 1916. It moved men like him to create not darkness but beauty, beauty in music. And that legacy, and I think music itself, often transports us back to the Great War. Some of the veterans that I interviewed in the 80s and 90s often said this, not specifically Vaughan Williams, but certain bits of music that they always connected to parts of the old front line, and it would transport them back to that moment when they were there doing whatever it was. So there's no trace of Vaughan Williams here because he thankfully survived the war and went on to achieve his greatness. But it's quite nice to sit here of a summer's day with the larks above you and play lark ascending and think of the men like him who pass through here. The cemetery reflects the operations and the casualties from Vimy, both in terms of the Canadians in 1917, but the earlier operations at Vimy as well. The British 25th Division took part in some major fighting on the crest of Vimy Ridge when the Germans attacked their positions in May of 1916. Many of the mine craters that we see up on the ridge today date from that period and date from operations uh, on both sides where British and German tunnellers were mining underneath the different positions along the ridge. The Canadians from the April 1917 battle are buried in Plot 5 and Plot 6. And again, you can walk that and see which units were coming in this direction for treatment compared to the ones that you see buried in Villers Station. The evacuation of wounded was a linear process where men were brought back in defined lines but not all to the same place for treatment because that would overwhelm casualty clearance stations and, and other medical facilities. So they would often have 
different divisions would have a line of evacuation back to one point and the neighboring division would have a line of evacuation back to another point. And you see that reflected in the burials. And there was another wooden cross here. In this case, the 29th Canadian Infantry Battalion had a wooden cross on this site. Where is it today? Again, if any listeners know, I'd be very interested to find out. And in terms of the total number of burials, there are 1,735 graves here. So it's quite a sizable cemetery from the Great War. 891 of those are British, 828 Canadian, so almost half the total, four South African, two Australian, and ten Germans. Again, the Germans being prisoners of war that were brought back for treatment but sadly died of their wounds. When we walk the plot for Vimy Ridge, we find many stories of Canadian soldiers who fought there in 1917, but one that's always drawn me in, which is mentioned in the entry for that soldier in the original cemetery register, is Stanley Stokes. He emigrated with his father Horace Stokes to Canada before the Great War and they both enlisted in 1915 and served with the 1st Battalion Canadian Infantry. Stanley was killed in the attack on Vimy Ridge on the 9th of April 1917 and his father was the one who found his body on the battlefield. He cradled that body and took it back for burial here. Didn't leave him up in the front line because he knew that if he did there was a fair chance that grave would be destroyed, something that both of them had probably seen in their service on the Somme or in Flanders. And he brought his boy back here for burial and he's buried in the Vimy plot. Horace went on to fight in other battles, in other trenches, but the war claimed him too and he was killed near aix noulette on the 19th of September 1917. His wife, Gertrude Stokes, was left bereft for not only had she lost her husband, she'd lost her boy as well. And even more tragically, Stanley Stokes, killed at Vimy Ridge, was only 16 years old when he fell. Arthur Curry, who went on to command the Canadian Corps, would often say that men like Horace and Stanley Stokes were the building blocks of Canada, were the men who'd made Canada what it was, and Canada should never forget them. So with that tragic story of the Stokes in mind, we'll leave a Quavre and make our way across to Mont saint Eloi. We won't go into the village, we'll stop at a viewing point where we can see up to where the village is located, and more importantly, the twin towers of the old Mont saint Eloi Abbey. This was an ancient abbey that dated back over many centuries. It's the original buildings up there, the original towers, and you can see shrapnel marks on them if you go up there and you can take a little diversion off to go up into the village itself the ground around them is now cleared and there's lots of good access they were damaged by shell fire during the great war so we are looking at a an original great war ruin when we look at those towers but standing here with the big grassland beneath almost in a bowl beneath that village of mont saint eloi this is where the nearest royal flying corps aerodrome to vimy ridge was located Pilots flew from here in support of the Canadians, taking aerial photographs, engaging in air combat with enemy aircraft over the battlefield, and units from both the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service flew from here at different points. And when we stand here today looking at the Twin Towers in front of us where and beneath it where the aerodrome was located, we can look to our right and in the distance we can see the trees of Vimy Ridge where the battlefield is located and we can see how close this aerodrome was to the actual front line. From here we follow the road into Neuville saint vast a small village just behind the front line on Vimy Ridge. As we come into the area where the village is located now we come to a big crossroads and on the left is a hand rising from a pile of rubble holding a torch. It's an interesting memorial, this one. It commemorates the rebuilding of the communities around northern France after the Great War. The hand is the hand of a soldier. You can see around the wrist is a French identity disc, like a bracelet. And in the hand is the torch, the torch of hope. And it symbolises the sacrifice rising from the rubble. Holding that torch of hope enables France, enables those communities destroyed in the war, to be rebuilt. It's quite a powerful memorial in many ways. We'll go into the village then to make our way up to Vimy and in 1917 this was a much smaller village, most of it destroyed by shell fire because there had been heavy fighting within this village between the French and the Germans in 1915. But beneath it were cellars which were joined up and there were cave systems here, tunnels, many of which dated back to medieval times. And one of the things that the Canadians did, like several units on the Arras front, is they joined them up and extended them 
and on the eve of the Battle of Arras and the eve of the attack on Vimy Ridge, Canadians can enter the tunnel system here and make their way safely underground up towards the forward zone of the battlefield in preparation to make their attack part of another tactic really utilised by the Canadians as part of their battle-winning operation here in 1917. So we've followed a route from behind the lines, a village where Canadians were billeted, where the Canadian Corps headquarters was located close by, where the medical facilities were to receive the wounded that would come back from the attack, and we've made our way gradually, just like soldiers in 1917, up towards the forward zone of the battlefield. We're not going to go through tunnels, we're going to continue through the village of Neuville and make our way up to the ridge itself. We cross over the motorway that comes down here heading towards Reims in one direction and then later on it branches to head down to Paris. It's a main route through this part of northern France, a motorway constructed in the 60s and 70s right through this part of the battlefield and one wonders what was then found during the excavations. There was no conflict battlefield archaeology in those days. What was lost, what was found, who knows. But we travel over the motorway we can see some french memorials to some of the 1915 fighting out in the fields and we come into an area where the trees suddenly change very different trees to the ones we're used to seeing in northern france because these are canadian trees brought in specially as saplings after the war to commemorate the canadian operations and the sacrifice here during the first world war where we are now is in the canadian memorial park we see that on a sign as we come in and this was the whole area of the ridge not the whole ridge but a section of it that was given to Canada after the war to commemorate the role of the Canadian troops here in 1917. The battlefield was left as it was and amongst the trees we can see the undulations of shell holes and trenches snaking their way across the landscape. Further up we can see massive mine craters from the operations here in 1916 before the attack on Vimy when both sides tunnelers were going underground in that war beneath the battlefield to blow each other up with charges of explosive that would destroy what was ever on the surface and the trees are not just here to hold that landscape together because that's what their roots do they're symbols they're symbols of sacrifice the trees were planted in memory of Canadian soldiers who fell in France during the First World War and have no known grave. So it was said that originally more than 11,000 trees were brought over to be planted on the ridge. We're familiar with that phrase, there is some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. That's the phrase of Rupert Brooke. Here it's a corner of a foreign field that is forever Canada. We're coming into a part of Canada on the Western Front in many ways. And what we see immediately is the brand new modern visitor centre on the right hand side that dates back to the centenary of the Great War period when a permanent visitor centre was opened here replacing some of the more temporary ones that had been here for some time previously. Here young Canadians work through different periods of the year acting as guides, acting as an information point. It's really interesting and important to talk to these young Canadians to ask them what brings them here, what inspires them to come to Vimy, what Vimy means to them. And they can tell you a lot of really interesting stories that they've learned as part of their duties as guides here during the months that they are here each year. They'll also take you on a guided tour, if you want one, of the trenches and down into the tunnels below. Because part of those important tunnel systems that were used by the Canadians on the eve of the Battle of Arras, on the eve of the attack on Vimy Ridge, are still accessible to the public and you can go down into them. When this site was made permanent in the 20s, an effort was made to preserve a section of battlefield with the tunnels beneath and the trenches above. And the trenches they knew would eventually cave in. If the trees weren't there to hold them together in the open landscape, the trenches would collapse. So a decision was made to place concrete sandbags and concrete duck boards within them to create what is obviously an artificial battlefield, an artificial looking battlefield. But I think the concrete sandbags, as they've aged over the decades, and the duck boards within and the firing positions, there are some original trench sniper plates that you can look through, for example, to peer into no man's land. It gives you an impression of what the trench system was like here. And what we're seeing as we come up to these trenches is what was called an outpost line. So this was a line which was held with only a handful of troops because it was very close to the enemy. When you peer up on the firing step over the top of the parapet of these trenches, you can look across a mine crater and there, just in front of you, is the German positions. Close enough to chuck a tin of bully beef uh, or a bottle of schnapps back the other way. Of course, they were lobbing 
much more lethal things in both directions, but very close. And if you pack your frontline positions full of men, you're inviting the enemy to kill them. So a handful of men would have been in up here on sentry duty, looking out across the battlefield, and the bulk of a unit behind them, where we've walked from the visitor centre through an area of trees where you can see some trenches. That is the old French front line that was taken over by the British in 1916 and was the main line of defence behind this outpost position that we see on this crest part of the lower slopes of Vimy Ridge. It's an interesting battlefield to explore both from beneath and above. You can walk through the trench system, you can see the mine craters, you can go into the German lines. There's an original German concrete observation bunker there you can go into. So it gives you that fascinating insight into the, the infrastructure of the battlefield that you don't always see elsewhere. I first visited Vimy in 1982 and I've seen a lot of changes here over the years. Access to parts of the Memorial Park are now greatly restricted for understandable reasons. The huge footfall that took place here during the centenary period saw hundreds of thousands of visitors and left to wonder where they liked on this battlefield they would do obviously quite a lot of damage to the great war landscape that is here but in those far off days you could walk from one side of the park to the other amongst the trees no one was really that bothered i used to find that many of the shell holes had a lot of detritus from the great war in them unexploded rifle grenades and mortar bombs even helmets and water bottles all of that of course is long gone and when you see today that the only thing amongst the trees are sheep, the sheep are cutting the grass, and there are red danger signs everywhere telling you this is an uncleared battlefield and it's too dangerous to enter. Well, of course, that is true. It's true of the wider fields around Vimy, not just within the park itself. There's just as much ordnance in those fields as there probably is here amongst the trees of Vimy Ridge. It's more of a statement of the modern world, I often think. But when they have tree falls, and I remember... In 91, there was a big storm across northern France that was similar to the storm in Sussex in 1987 that was devastating to the county of Sussex and the south of England. It was a similar thing here in northern France in 91, and Vimy lost quite a lot of trees then. And amongst the roots, you could see the detritus yet again of the Great War, even rifles and bayonets. So there's a lot beneath the surface here, and probably a lot of soldiers, particularly from that earlier fighting, the French always had a habit of burying their dead in the front line area and no doubt there are the graves of missing poilus somewhere across this battlefield. I think all of that is what contributes towards the incredible atmosphere that you get when you come to this memorial park. The light amongst the trees is something that I notice right throughout the year. It's a different kind of light, the way the light is filtered through the trees that are here and it lights the landscape below those crumbling trenches and shell holes from the Great War. From the visitor centre and the trenches and the tunnels beneath, we'll make our way up to the very crest of the ridge now, the highest point of Vimy Ridge at Hill 145. Hill 145 was the name that the French gave to this. They didn't use Vimy Ridge. But here we are on a bit of high ground that's 145 metres above sea level. And once we get to that crest, we can see beyond down onto that Douai Plain and we get an incredible view. On clear days, we can easily see the city of Lille to the north, and on very clear days, with a pair of binoculars, you can find the church spire of Messines on the Messines Ridge in Flanders across the border in Belgium. It just shows the importance of bits of high ground on these Great War battlefields. But what we get to, of course, when we come to the crest of the ridge is the magnificent Vimy Memorial. Now, we looked at this in greater depth in a previous podcast episode, and I would direct you back to that to have a listen to it. But what we've got here is Walter Allward's dream. This is the result of his dream, this incredible dream that he had that gave him this depiction of the type of memorial that he wanted to construct, which is what he then showed in his architect's model and which what led to the construction of this memorial here, construction that began in the 20s until it was finally finished and unveiled in July of 1936. And in that Vimy pilgrimage of that year, 10,000 Canadians came over from Canada on special boats across to England and then down with trains to the coast and across on ferries and more trains and charabangs and buses that brought them out onto the battlefield. The pilgrimage was not just about attending the ceremony here, it was a wider one to visit the graves of the fallen. Many families coming all that way from Canada for the first and perhaps the last time stood at a loved one's grave. 
people died during the pilgrimage, perhaps because of the shock of seeing those graves. Pilgrimages like that are fascinating. They're interesting bits of social history. What did people talk about on those pilgrimages to each other? What was the focus? Was it all about the dead? Was it for the veterans coming to terms with the things that they'd seen, the memories that they'd had and the mates that they'd left, the comrades that they'd left behind? Less than two decades after the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the trauma, the reality of it was brutally sharp still in the minds of those people. So no wonder some of them didn't survive their pilgrimage. But the whole expedition of all those people coming from Canada came together in front of this memorial under that summer sky of July 1936. King Edward VIII, who'd been the Prince of Wales during the Great War, was here in one of the very few duties that he exercised outside of Great Britain before his abdication. He was here as part of the group of official dignitaries. Julian Bing, who'd commanded the Canadians, was here. Arthur Curry, who went on to command the Canadians in the final phase of the war and had been a divisional commander here, had passed away some three years previously. So Curry was not here to stake his claim within the historiography of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. He was consulted about where this memorial should go. It wasn't always necessarily going to be Vimy. For him, being the commander in the last 100 days of the war, he felt that was Canada's finest moment in the conflict. He wanted a memorial to be sited there. But the sheer size of this structure and the fact that it would eventually go on to commemorate not just the capture of the ridge, but Canadian missing in France from 1915 until the end of the war, meant that this was really the only site that it could ever be built. And here it stands, triumphant for Canada, dominating this part of the Western Front like the ridge had dominated the battlefield in 1917. The figures of mourning around it, expressing the loss of Canada's 66,000 dead in the Great War, and the two columns rising to the heavens with the spirits of the fallen. It's a symbolic monument. Every part of it is symbolic in some ways. It's a memorial that will move you, that will change you, I think, when you visit it, and one that will always, always impress even the most casual of visitor. On its firm base are the names of 11,239 Canadian soldiers who fell in France from the summer of 1915 until the end of the war on the 11th of November 1918 who have no known grave. The names seem to go on forever, an A to Z of Canadian surnames, not just British names. We mentioned how multinational the Canadian Expeditionary Force was and we see that reflected in the types of men who are commemorated here and the backgrounds and the religions and the cultures that they represent from where they came. Many a casual visitor will look at those names and think they're all men who fell in the capture of Vimy Ridge, but they express the history of so many different battles and more than half of them relate to the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the missing of Corselettes, of the battles for Corselette village and beyond in the fighting for Regina Trench and Desire Trench. And when we walk up and across the memorial round to the, the big figure of Canada mourning for her lost sons looking out across the Douai Plain, we can get the sense of what Walter Allwood was trying to achieve with this memorial, bringing together really the crisscross paths of Canada's Great War experience, not just the Battle of Vimy Ridge. This was what the Great War meant to Canada. It had paved its way in that new world but it had come at a cost, and this memorial expressed the grief that surrounded that cost. And it stands for so much of what modern Canadians think when they think of the Great War. This is where they come. Back in December, when it was possible to travel again to the old front line in between lockdowns, I came here with my old pal Andrew. We were probably the only people up on the ridge when we arrived. We parked the car and we went out on foot. He went one way, I went the other. We were lost in our thoughts for this memorial and we met up on the top again underneath Allwood's tall towers of remembrance. Coming along the path towards the memorial was another visitor and I'm always curious when I'm out on the battlefields. Why are these people here? What have they come to see? And I speak to them and it's always a rewarding conversation to have to find out why someone is there. And this was a young Canadian backpacking his way through a winter Europe, seeing places he'd always dreamt of seeing, culture, art, music, everything that a young Canadian would want to find in their journey across the European landscape. 
but a dim remembrance of Canada's wider history and the cost, the path that had brought freedom in Canada to generations like his brought him here to Vimy Ridge. Even in the depths of winter, on a cold day with snow still on the ground, the Vimy Memorial had acted like that beacon to bring a young Canadian to this part of the Great War battlefields. And that brings us to the end of our first part of Vimy Ridge in a day. In part two, we'll look at the ridge from north to south. In the second part of our look at Vimy Ridge in a day, we're going to examine the ridge from north to south. When many people come to Vimy, as we've said previously, they go straight to the memorial, the visitor centre, the Canadian Memorial Park. There's a much wider battlefield around that, and it's that wider battlefield that we'll explore in this part. We're starting, though, behind the front, like we did before, this time in the village of Suchet, a village captured by the French in the fighting of 1915. French troops came down from Notre Dame de Lorette into Suchet en route towards the high ground of Vimy Ridge during the, the battles of Artois that year. And even then, it was laid waste by shell fire, destroyed in the bombardments. By the end of the war, almost nothing of it was left. In the middle of the village, near to one of the local banks, is a piece of stonework, all that's left of the original village of Suchet. We'll cut through there, following a road that takes us across a valley known as Zouave Valley to the British. There's a Zouave Valley Cemetery at the far end of it. Zouaves were French colonial troops. They fought through here in those attacks of 1915, and when the British took over, some of the bodies of the Zouaves were said to be on the slopes of this valley. They could be easily spotted by their very colourful uniforms that they wore. And that's how this valley got its name. And it was a route by 1917 up to the front line. This northern part of Vimy Ridge that's above us, there was communication trenches going up the slopes of this valley up towards the forward positions. And when you take the road up here, that takes you underneath the motorway at one point, but before that, as you come up, you can see in some of the fields the zigzag shapes of some of the trenches still visible. They still retain some of their depth. Although it's outside of the area of the park, there are some other trenches that do survive from that period. We'll follow the road, go under the motorway, and that will bring us to the first of the Canadian battlefield cemeteries that we'll see in this part of the Look at Vimy in a Day, and that's Givinchion Goel Canadian Cemetery. This was a Canadian Corps battlefield burial site made following the attack on Vimy Ridge on the 9th of April 1917. The men who were buried here were symbolically laid to rest on the remains of the German front line that they'd captured. So their sacrifice, like warriors of old, marked the spot where they fell. And here they lie in perpetuity, guarding the place that was paid for in their blood. Almost all of the burials are from the Vimy Ridge battle. There's a few 1918 burials. Of the total, 144 are Canadian, 8 British, and 2 whose unit is unknown. The Canadian dead within this cemetery, a small battlefield cemetery, are largely from the 4th Canadian Division, principally the 38th, 72nd and 73rd Battalions are quite highly represented amongst the headstones as you walk along them. So in that respect it's a bit of a comrade cemetery, men who had served together, fought together, taken part in the attack together and died together, capturing this line, are buried together. Coming up to this cemetery, it gives us access to the northern part of Vimy Ridge. The ridge reaches a crest to the position known on British maps as the Pimple. It drops away to the east, down towards the village of Givinchy, Givenchy en Goel, not to be confused with Givinchy Le La Basse up to the north. There's a wood beyond the Bois en Ash. This is slightly outside of the area of the Canadian Corps assault, and we won't concern ourselves with that. But this northern part of the ridge can be accessed from here. There's a couple of different ways up to it. A road that runs parallel to the motorway and then you can go on foot or you can cut round and go past the village of Givenchy on the edge of it and come up to the Pimple that way. The colonial troops of the French army that fought here in 1915 took this ground and a trench line was established on the slopes back towards Suchet village, the ground that we kind of come from. And that's where the front line stayed. British troops then took over and in May 1916 the 47th London Division were holding this ground with their neighbouring 25th Division over to their right in the area that's now the main memorial park 
and the Germans launched a sizeable attack against the British positions on this part of the ridge. The London lads, in particular units like the Post Office Rifles, for example, lost quite heavy casualties up here in that battle of the 21st, 22nd of May 1916. The Canadians took over later that year and in the assault on Vimy Ridge on the 9th of April, the first day of the battle, an attack was not made here. The ridge further to the south was taken, the slopes of Hill 145 were assaulted and then the final phase saw the capture of this high point here on the northern part of the ridge, the Pimple area, by the units of the 4th Canadian Division in the final phase of the battle until the whole ridge was taken by the 14th of April 1917. In many ways, the capture of the Pimple was the final bit in the Vimy jigsaw, and it helped secure victory. From here, this was the last bit of high ground that dominated the battlefield. With this taken, the high ground was in the entire hands of the Canadian Corps, and they now dominated the landscape here. When I first used to come up here, there was a, a memorial, a battalion memorial, to the 44th Canadian Infantry. They had been one of the units that had served here in the Battle of April 1917, and in early 1918 before the war was over when the Canadians came back to the Vimy sector at that time they came up here their pioneer section came up here and built a memorial made out of concrete on a little mound it had a wooden cross on the top and then panels around each side listing the dead by the end of the war the memorial was damaged by later shell fire the panels were removed and taken back to Canada but the monument remained and round the edge of it round the lip of it on all four sides it said 44 Canada so it was a proper memorial, and even in its kind of reduced state, you could see it was an important structure. And when I wrote my book, Walking Arras, I included the story of that in the book. But by the time the book came out, the memorial was gone, sadly. There were field changes, land ownership changes, I think, and a farmer did approach the Canadians and asked them if they wanted the memorial, but nothing was really done about it, perhaps because the memorial had been taken back in its entirety, in many respects, to Canada, it wasn't felt necessary to preserve this, sadly, really, because it was an important survivor of the way Vimy was commemorated. But sadly, it is now gone. There is a new memorial up here, which I actually haven't seen yet. So it's been up here a while, but I haven't been up for a few years. And it commemorates the role of Canadian troops up here. But it's not quite the same as seeing an original memorial dating from 1918. When I first came up here in the late 80s, the remains of the mine craters that went right across this part of the ridge were still visible. Not in their entire depth as they had been before, but they'd been filled in gradually through field clearance and other things as well. I suspect chucking junk in them as well, to be honest. But on the surface level, there was always a lot of remains of Great War detritus, not just from the Canadian assault, but from the early attacks. I remember finding bits of French bayonets up here from the 1915 battles. From the Pimple, we can cut down through the park, going past Walter Allwood's memorial, the Vimy Memorial, and down into the area close to where we were before, where the mine craters are visible, where we can see the visitor centre ahead of us, and we'll turn off into an area where there are several Canadian battlefield cemeteries. The first of these is Givinci Road Canadian Cemetery. It's got a circular wall around it, so it looks like it's a mine crater cemetery, but it's not. I think it's just the, the design of the cemetery the architect chose when this was made a permanent burial site. It is a collective burial, though, so a communal burial where the men are buried side by side, possibly in shell holes or a specially constructed trench. There are 111 Canadian burials here, two of which are unknown, and they're all men who died on the 9th of April 1917 in the attack on Vimy Ridge. The vast majority are from the 4th Canadian Division. The southern part of their line came through here and the 54th, the Kootenay Battalion, which we mentioned, Colonel Kemble's old battalion, of course, he'd been killed not far from where we are now on the 1st of March 1917 and a new commander had taken over from him, but they made an attack here with the 102nd Canadian Infantry Battalion from British Columbia and they were two units that advanced on the slopes of Hill 145 taking enfilade fire from some of the German positions that had survived the bombardment. One of those buried in here from the Kootenay Battalion from the 54th was Private Frank Ash. We heard about Private Stanley Stokes, who was killed on the 9th of April, age 16, and his body found by his father. And when we discovered that he was just a teenage Tommy and had died only 16 years old, sadly that was not unique in the history of the attack on Vimy Ridge. There were several 16-year-old Canadians killed that day, and Private Frank Ash, buried here, is another one of them. 
His surviving papers show that he told the army that he was much older and had got away with it. He was obviously a big lad, looked much older than he was. And like the teenage Tommies that Richard Van Emden has researched in his book, Boy Soldiers of the Great War, the desire of young men in Canada to lie about their age and join up was no different to the desire of young men in Britain to lie about their age and join the British Army. Around this cemetery we can see the remains of the preserved battlefield landscape, the shell holes, the signs of trenches and the evidence of battle. For me it's part of what makes the visit to these Canadian battlefield cemeteries within the Memorial Park more evocative is that they sit within the echoes, the shadows of the landscape that once was here more than a hundred years ago. And we can walk along the path to the cemetery we can see just opposite, a much bigger cemetery with an original plot from the Canadian Corps burial parties made during the capture of Vimy Ridge. It's a slightly different angles to the rest of the burials towards the centre part of the cemetery. This is Canadian Cemetery Number 2, made, as we've stated, during the Canadian attack, but then used post-war as a concentration cemetery from the wider area of this part of northern France. In fact, it remained in use for burials right up to 1947, and then there's evidence that again burials were made here in the 1950s and 60s. After that time, a policy was made that one cemetery would remain open for each country. So Cement House up in Belgium for the burials that were found in Belgium and the area around Flanders, for example, or the movement of graves from other parts of Belgium when that was required, they were taken to Cement House. And for France, it was Turlington Cemetery up on the coast near Boulogne. So while this is very much an Arras and to a degree of Vimy Cemetery with the Canadian burials, there are men from a wide area of the British part of the Western Front. Almost all of them unknowns that were found in that often long post-war period after the Great War. In total, there are 2,232 British burials here, 641 Canadian, 19 Australian, 7 New Zealanders, 2 South Africans, 2 Newfoundlanders and 1 Indian. 70% of the dead are unidentified and that shows in a concentration cemetery where graves are brought in from surrounding battlefields, it's not uncommon because they're recovering the dead and very often on those dead soldiers there is nothing to identify who they were. Perhaps a button, perhaps a shoulder title, a bit of insignia that gives a clue to a unit or a nationality, but that's it. When we go to the original plot of the cemetery where the Canadian dead are located, there's a lot of 87th Canadian Infantry Battalion men who were cut down by machine gun fire as they tried to cross this part of the ridge. When you look at Canadian headstones and you read the inscriptions, Canadian families didn't have to pay for them if they couldn't afford to do that. It was paid for on behalf of them by their government. So you see quite a lot of them. And very often, the statements are challenging in some way. There's a challenge of the worthiness of sacrifice and of the reasons behind that sacrifice. And on the grave of Company Sergeant Major Phillips of the 87th, who was killed on the 9th of April 1917, aged 27, his family wrote, When the drum rolls... Let your mood be worthy of our deaths. And that poses all sorts of questions as to the meaning behind that. There was that feeling, and all for what? What had been the sacrifice for? And it's interesting, you see this often discussed, if that's the right word for it, a lot in the inscriptions on the headstones of Canadian soldiers. The names of battles are not always recorded on the headstones. In fact, it's quite rare. But here, right on the battlefield at Vimy Ridge the grave of Private Portmore of the 54th Battalion, killed on the 9th of April 1917, aged 43, reads, Killed in action, Vimy Ridge. Two decades after the Great War, fighting returned to this region of France in May 1940 as the German Blitzkrieg swept through here and the British forces pulled back to the coast near Dunkirk. Four years later, the ground was liberated by British troops as they advanced through this region of northeastern France. The Guards Armoured Division were close to here, the 11th Armoured Division. And as Vimy still very much dominated the landscape, soldiers saw it as they passed. And their commander, too, the commander of 21st Army Group, Bernard Montgomery, he came here on a visit as this ground was liberated, and he had with him a team of photographers who photographed him visiting the Vimy Memorial and coming to this Canadian Cemetery Number 2, no doubt they asked him to pose with a particular grave and may have suggested one that was perhaps 
more photogenic or represented this kind of sacrifice that was happening right then, right there, just up the road, as these men advanced into the German forces and pushed them out of France into Belgium. But I like to think of Monty possibly ignoring their advice and looking round the cemetery with his own keen eye and spotting something and saying, I want the photograph there. So he was photographed kneeling against the graves of unknown soldiers, but not just any unknown soldiers. One of them was an unknown soldier of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. So what's the symbolism of that? Bernard Montgomery went to war in 1914 as a subaltern of that regiment, and I like to think his eye caught that badge as he looked along the rows of graves and decided to give a nod back to the old war, his old war, and the men he'd served alongside then. Leaving Canadian Cemetery No. 2, we'll follow the road past the Broadmarsh Crater, the road forks, and we take the left-hand fork coming out of the Canadian Memorial Park, and a bit further up you can take a track through the trees that takes you to the site of the 3rd Canadian Divisional Memorial, a memorial that I suspect many people who come here don't even know is there. It wasn't signposted very well for years, but it is now, and you can follow a path into it and have a look. It's a memorial that dates back again to the war itself on a spot where an original memorial was placed to record the sacrifices of that Canadian formation that fought through this part of Vimy Ridge. From there, as we continue along the road that takes us across this part of the ridge, we've come out of the area where the Canadian trees are, where the landscape is clear, but amongst these trees we can see just as many signs of the Great War, the trenches and the shell holes. And here we're behind the German lines in terms of the beginning of the Battle of Arras. It'll bring us out onto the main road where we turn right and go into the village of Thalu, Thalus as the troops called it, and we'll see Thalus Military Cemetery out in the fields where there's 245 Canadian burials from the April 1917 fighting. It's a cemetery located on the dividing line between the 2nd and 3rd Canadian divisions and the units within represent that. In the village of Telu, we can see one of the again one of the original Canadian memorials here at Vimy, the Artillery Memorial. We spoke about the million rounds fired on Vimy Ridge by the artillery and Curry and Bing and all the other commanders knew that this battle was largely won by the role of artillery. It wasn't just the troops capturing the ground, they needed the guns to support them, to give them the ability to do that. And so one of the first memorials that goes up is this one, to the gunners. Quite a simple memorial, surrounded by shells, but symbolic of the importance of artillery on the battlefield, both here at Vimy and the wider Western Front. Outside of Tello is two mine crater cemeteries, and we discussed these in a previous podcast episode. Zivi and Litchfield craters were old mine craters from the previous fighting, from the previous holding the line here, and when the Canadians moved forward, they buried their dead in them, creating two unique Canadian cemeteries of the Great War, with men buried in mine craters, no headstones, but their names listed on a screen wall. And again, I think these battlefield cemeteries that the Canadians made here, and that remain more than a century later, is what gives the whole wider Vimy battlefield its importance and I think it's poignancy as well. Telu Thales was completely destroyed in the bombardments of the Great War and rebuilt in the usual 20s style, and we go through it, and coming out to the far side, we find another Canadian battlefield cemetery, the Bois Carré Cemetery. Bois Carré, Square Wood, was the name of a wood close by this part of the battlefield, and here we've come down into the 1st Canadian Division sector. So all four Canadian divisions attacked here, the 4th in the north, then the 3rd, and the 2nd, and here the 1st, the 1st Canadian Division, the original Canadians, you'll remember, who joined up at the very beginning of the war and were the first to be sent to the Western Front in their own formation. Those 1st Canadian Division burials all date from the April 1917 fighting, but the cemetery remained in use for the rest of the Canadian Corps occupation of this line because it was in a safe space on the reverse slope of the ridge. Men could be brought back here for burial. And when we look around the cemetery, we see that from that fighting that resonated through here again in 1940, there are some World War II graves as well. In total, there are 371 Canadian burials, 116 British, there are 59 unknown burials and 15 special memorials. One of the Canadians buried here, and the date jumps out at you when you look at the headstone, was killed in 1919, so not died of injuries 
or died of influenza. He was killed clearing the battlefields. And there were several casualties like this as men went round clearing the ordnance, looking for the dead. I remember reading in a Canadian war diary some time ago of one of these clearance parties that they'd handed in their gas masks on a particular day and a couple of days later they were out on the battlefields looking for the dead and one of them put a pick straight through a gas shell and because they had no mask to protect them, there were casualties. The cruel hand of war still claiming victims months after the fighting was over. Coming out of the village and moving away from the cemetery, across the fields on our right, we can follow a path to another Canadian memorial dating back to the war. This is the memorial cross to the 1st Canadian Division. They attacked on the southern flank of the ridge, on this lower part of Vimy, and there are photographs showing the unveiling of this memorial taken during the war. The 1st Canadian Division, as we'd said, had gone to war with 70% of its men having been born in Britain. Of the men who went over the top from that division on the 9th of April 1917 in the attack here at Vimy Ridge, I would guess that a much higher proportion were Canadian born. A few months after Vimy, the Military Service Act came into being and Canadians were conscripted and the demographics of the army changed even more. But battles like this were not fixed points. They were part of the evolving nature, not just of warfare, but of these armies themselves. And the Canadians who had fought at Ypres in 1915 were very different to the Canadians who were at Arras and at Vimy in 1917. All fighting for Canada, all fighting for a nation that had given them a home, given them work, given them shelter, all fighting for that new world that they had forged in the years of peace. Coming away from Telu, from Thales, we can cut down towards the village of Farbus. Across the fields on our right are the Farbus Woods. It's private land, but some years ago I had the chance to go in and have a explore of these woods, and there are some quite hefty German bunkers in there. There are some wartime photographs of the Canadians from the 1st Division having captured this area during the opening stage of the Vimy Battle, and inside the bunkers were German guns, and there's pictures of the Canadians holding the shells and standing there amongst the artillery. It was an important part of the German defences, and once it was overrun, it denied the Germans the use of their own artillery to defend the ground around them. So it was an important part of the victory here on this southern flank of Vimy Ridge. We think of Vimy as a, a modern battle, fought in a modern way, part of the genesis of modern warfare, you could argue. But there was always in these battles of the Great War some kind of nod to the past, and the Canadian Cavalry Brigade came through here on the 9th of April 1917. Troops mounted on horseback came across this ground and charged the German positions. Cavalry, right to the end of the war, could be used like this to exploit positions and to go forward in a reconnaissance role to see where the enemy were. And the Canadians, like other formations, always kept their Canadian, their mounted troops, close by. And they would play a prominent role at different points within the Great War, particularly in those battles of 1918. And beyond Farbus, we come out onto the roads past the village. Ahead of us in the distance, we can see Vimy itself, the village of Vimy that gives the ridge its name. We can look back along the ridge here. We can see the trees of the ridge. We can see the top of the Canadian Memorial on Hill 145. The whole battlefield is there for us to see. We've ended our north to south journey. We're standing here on this part of the Western Front that will be forever associated with Canada's exploit, Canada's sacrifice in the Great War. Vimy, for many, is Canada's finest battle. It may not have been, but that doesn't really matter. Here, Vimy stands as Canada's beacon, Canada's point in which all of those paths, from Flanders to Festibut to the Somme to the DQ line to a young Canadian officer of a cavalry regiment crying, it's a charge, boys, it's a charge, on the Somme in the spring of 1918, through to the final shots in the streets of the city of Mons and George Lawrence Price dying just minutes before the armistice. Here Canada's story somehow comes together. Canada's path, her indelible footsteps along the old front line. Thank you.
You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at SOMCOR. You can follow the podcast at Old Frontline Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>